Since it is Sunday, I thought it would be a good moment to uh, talk and reflect on the Mass and worship of God. In the Old Testament, we hear that God was very precise in how he wanted to be worshipped. He wanted uh, the best of the produce that was to be offered, the first fruits. It's called the first fruits. He was very specific about the animals, the condition of the animals that would be sacrificed to him, a lamb without blemish, a year old, uh, etc. All very, very, very specific. But then we read in the book of Malachi, the prophet, that the Jewish leaders, many of them, started keeping the best animals for themselves. And they started giving to the temple for sacrifice the uh, lambs that were crippled or maybe had a broken leg or, you know, they were the worst of the sacrifices. And this displeased God and he let it be known. He said to Malachi, oh, that someone would shut up the temple gates and I will not accept your offerings anymore. And he said, and this is the part that concerns us, that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice will be offered to my name. And the Gentiles, the nations, would be offering this sacrifice. Now when you think for a moment that the Jews are the chosen people, and yet God says to them, that it is the nations, the Gentiles, that will be offering a pure sacrifice. That's quite an astounding statement from God. And when he says, from the rising of the sun to, the, to its setting, that means a number of things. It means continual, non-stop. It means from one end of the earth to the other. It means all nations. A continual sacrifice. And then, when you hear him say, a pure sacrifice, or an immaculate sacrifice will be offered, depending on various translations. What is something that's pure? It is without blemish, without stain, immaculate, clean, as clean as it can be. It's pure. What sacrifice could possibly be offered to God that would be a pure sacrifice? We already know from St. Paul, he says, you know, the, the, you know, don't think that the blood of ox and bulls you know, did away with sin. The old system was just kind of a precursor, a setup for what was going to come. And God, for the moment, with an eye to the future, accepted the sacrifice. He set it up. He ordered it to be the way it is. But in and of itself, the sacrifice of blood, of uh, the blood of goats and bulls and lambs didn't have any uh, power within itself. It was just the power that God gave it with an eye to the pure sacrifice that he mentions here and he tells the prophet Malachi. So when we are looking at this and wondering, well, what is a pure sacrifice? What could possibly be offered to God that God could accept as absolutely pure? Well, what is pure? Anything that would come from sinful man would immediately be impure, no matter what it was. We don't possess anything pure because we are impure. There's nothing that we could give to God that would be a pure sacrifice. 
We are all conceived in original sin. We continue to commit sin. We sometimes live in states of sin. We struggle with sin. The whole world is infected with the poison of original sin. What is there that is pure that man could offer to God? And yet, God says, you know, the nations, a pure sacrifice will be offered in my name. Well, the only thing that could be offered to God that would be pure would be God himself. Only God is pure. And only God could be an acceptable sacrifice to God. There's nothing else, there's nothing else that could be offered to God. So even here, thousand years before, we have this hint, this illusion, this uh, suggestion that there will be a new sacrifice. That this blood and the blood of the goats and the ox and the lambs and, you know, sometimes you can't trust the, the, the priests in the temple because they're keeping the best ones back. They're holding them back for themselves. And, you know, this is not going to remain the way it is. And God tells Malachi that. And then we hear this uh, in Jeremiah. Matter of fact, it's easy to remember. It's Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Very easy. Jeremiah 31, 31. The only time ever in the Old Testament, ever, does God the Father say, I will make a new covenant, a new sacrifice, a new and everlasting covenant. And you never hear about it again, ever, in the Old Testament. God the Father tells Jeremiah, and then never again do you hear that phrase. And when you think about the span in years of the Old Testament, the centuries and centuries of Jewish history, it's pretty remarkable that you only hear this one time. And you never hear it again. And then... In the New Testament, all of a sudden, at the Last Supper, our blessed Lord is sitting there with his disciples, his apostles, and he says this, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. The first person of the Holy Trinity says that, to Jeremiah and all those hundreds and hundreds of years go by Jeremiah was there for the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians hundreds of years go by we never hear about it again and then at the Last Supper the second person of the Blessed Trinity says the same words but this time he says it in actuality the first person, when God the Father says to Jeremiah, I will make a new and everlasting covenant. He's speaking in the future. So it is a divine prophecy from the lips of God himself. And when God has a prophecy, it's actually a promise. So centuries go by. And then God comes and actually fulfills the prophecy, his promise. He keeps his word and says this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Do this in memory of me. So now we have the promise. For, remember, first of all, we have Malachi being told, one day the nations will make the pure sacrifice to me from the rising of the sun to the setting, to its setting. And everywhere, my name will be praised among the Gentiles. 
God tells Jeremiah, new covenant, I will make a new and everlasting covenant, and then the Logos himself in flesh takes his hands, holds that chalice, and says, this is the new and everlasting covenant. It is a beautiful, remarkable thing when you contemplate God and what he says and what he promises and then how the promise gets delivered. It's always greater and deeper than what we ever imagined. You know, the old covenant was you know, a spoken word between God and Abraham, David, uh, you know, Moses, a promise of this, a promise of that, always fulfilled. It's always man that breaks the covenant. But this time, God comes and his blood himself is the covenant. He is the covenant, not just a promise, not just an unfolding, but that very covenant is God himself. He is the covenant. And notice what he says at the Last Supper. Do this in memory of me. What does he do at the Last Supper? He sort of instructs them how to do this. Why? Well, we know that he longed, he told us, you know, I have longed to have this Passover supper with you, to have this supper with you. And we see in this moment God instructing his apostles in how this will be done. It's very, very precise. Why? Well, because he knew. Our Lord knew that, frankly, we would mess it up. Right? Don't we generally mess up a lot of things? It's how we are. We don't mean to sometimes, but, you know, we're kind of not the brightest creatures around, and we mess things up. So our Lord is very, very careful to make certain that he is the one who will direct how this memorial will be conducted. He takes charge and he shows them how it will be done. And then he tells them, do this in memory of me. Not what you want to do, not how you want to put your spin on it, but this. And when he says, do this in memory of me, that's an important word, that term, memory, to the Jews. Remember who's sitting there. Jesus is Jewish. The apostles are Jewish. And they're all, they know what that word means to their religion. If any of you ever have the occasion to go to a, uh, a Jewish Seder, uh, Jewish meal, uh, and watch and listen to what, when they talk about memory in Judaism. Memory doesn't mean just remembering like, you know, you have a 50th anniversary and you remember 50 years ago when you got married, or you have a birthday and you're just remembering that 34 years ago you were born. No, to the Jewish mind, to talk about something in the religious, Jewish religious mind, to talk about something in memory means to reach back in time and bring it forward so that it becomes alive again. We go back to that moment. We, the, the moment lives again as though it were happening for the first time. That's what memory means in a religious context to the Jews. 
So when our Lord tells the apostles, do this whenever you do this in memory of me, it doesn't matter if it happens in the year 35, the year 216, the year 1512, or the year 2013. We are going back to that moment that is alive for us by virtue of what we are doing. Do this in memory of me. So it is not like a Memorial Day. Many nations have Memorial Days where they honor their dead and they just remember that the dead sacrificed themselves on a battlefield or on a ship or you know, wherever they may have died. That is a memorialization. That is not what our Lord is talking about. He is talking about reaching back in time and coming to this moment again. And when he says that, the apostles would have understood what he meant. It's why when the apostles begin doing this themselves, they do it exactly as our blessed Lord instructed them to. What is the first public act that our Lord did after the resurrection? They had a private meeting with Mary Magdalene in the garden. While the Gospels don't record it, we know he had a private meeting with our Blessed Mother. Almost all of the church fathers and doctors of the church who spoke of that said that he would have appeared to our Blessed Mother first. How come Our Lady, this is off topic for a moment, but how come Our Lady wasn't one of the women walking to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning? She'd already seen Our Lord. She had no reason to go to the tomb. She knew he wasn't there. How did she know he wasn't there? She knew by faith and she knew by sight. Imagine that beautiful moment. The last time they would have looked at each other, our Lord would have looked at her, probably horrible sadness, even though she knew he was going to rise from the dead. That doesn't make this moment, this crucifixion moment, an unimportant moment unemotional moment it's her son nailed to a tree and a sword your own soul shall pierce and again while it's not recorded it is very likely that the very last thing our Lord did or the very last action he performed was to look into the eyes of the new Eve since he was the new Adam. And when he says it is finished, he means this act of recreation is finished. Only three times in all of scriptures do we hear God say it is finished. Once is when he finishes creating the natural universe, the natural world. The second time is from the cross. And the third time is in the book of Revelation, in the apocalypse, uh, when he speaks from the throne and says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, it is finished. So here's our Lord from the cross looking at his mother. Their eyes meet, probably locked, and he probably was looking at her when he said, it is finished. Eve, it's done. And then he looks to his father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Our Blessed Mother there to receive his body off the cross. Think of the care with which she would have laid him in the tomb. The meticulous taking his blood-soaked sweat hair, moving it off his face, kissing the wounds of the crown of thorns, placing his arms over. She would have done all of that. And then she retires and waits to see him again with total confidence that what he said was true. 
So she's not at the tomb. She doesn't even occur to her to go. Why would it? She knows he's not there. So our Lord appears to her privately. Whenever it happened, it happened. You've got to imagine that the very first person he would have appeared to would have been Mary, his own mother. She sat there and suffered like no other human being ever could have suffered because this wasn't just her son. It was also the son of God, her king, and she knew that as well, more than anyone else who has, who has ever lived. So because of that, her suffering would have been more intense than anyone else could have ever borne. And as a result, her joy would have been greater than anyone else could have carried at the sight of her son standing there in front of her on that Easter Sunday morning, probably wrapped in prayer, raptured in prayer. And all of a sudden she looks up and and all, all the mothers will get this. There's her baby boy, all risen from the dead. There's her God, her king, her baby boy, her son, standing there in all of his resurrection glory. It's always nice to have a reflection of that, but back to the point. So, our Lord appears privately to his mother. We know he appeared privately to Peter. Remember when the disciples who encountered our Lord on the road to Emmaus, they go, you know, we're going to come back to this part of it, but as soon as they realize it's Jesus, they're like, oh my gosh, they get up and they run back to Jerusalem and they bust in the door and they look around for everything. They're like, where is, you know, what, hey, we've seen the Lord. And they go, yeah, yeah, we know he appeared to Peter. So he'd already appeared to Peter, again, a private apparition. He appeared to Mary Magdalene, to his mother, to Peter. But what is his first public? Meaning there was someone else there to see it. There was more than one person. It wasn't a private thing. What was that? That was the uh, appearance to the disciples on the road to Amos. And we know one of them by name. We don't know the other one. It doesn't say. But they go. They are walking along the road. Jesus is telling them the scriptures, how everything in the Old Testament points to him. And then they stop because it's starting to get dark. The sun's starting to set. They go in. They ask Jesus to stay with them. So he begins as the guest. He acts as though he's going to continue going on. They say, stay with us, Lord, for the day is almost over and the night is drawing near. And he goes in and he turns from being the guest to the host. He takes charge once he gets in there. And what does he do? He takes the bread, he breaks it, he gives it to them, and at that moment, the sacred scriptures tell us, their eyes were opened and they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. They remembered from Thursday night. This is Sunday night. They remember from Thursday night. They remembered. They were brought back to the reality the reality that in this sacrifice is God, is Christ, is the new and everlasting covenant. They had a hint of it. They sort of were maybe kind of thinking along those lines because they say to each other, after our Lord vanishes from their sight, was not your heart burning inside you as he was telling us these things, as he was revealing the sacred scriptures to us. So they were being prepared with the word, but it was when the living word, the Logos himself, presents himself in the sacrifice, that's when they get it. If anybody asks you what's the first thing Jesus did, 
publicly on the day he rose from the dead, he offered mass. It's the very first thing he did. He went through the readings, all of the scripture, and then he sat down with them and moved right into the liturgy of the, the, the Eucharist. Readings, sacrifice. The high priest offered mass. It was the first thing he did. Makes sense. So they go running back to the apostles, and then we hear, you know, oh, he already appeared to Peter, we know. And then, while they're all there, comes the first corporate meeting, minus, of course, Judas, who's hanging from a tree, and Thomas, who we hear just isn't there. We don't know why. And the first thing he says is, peace be with you. And he repeats it, peace be with you. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. But before that, he says, receive the Holy Spirit. See, this was a Pentecost. When we think Pentecost, we think of Our Lady and the Apostles in the upper room, you know, after the Ascension, nine days after the Ascension. And that is Pentecost. But there were two Pentecosts. There was this private Pentecost with the apostles. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathed on them. And that word breathe, that use of it only happens one other time in all of the scriptures. And it happens, it's that word breathe when God formed Adam from the dust of the earth and formed him up into man and he breathed into him. It's the only other time we hear that word in scripture. So God the Father creates and breathes his divine life into man and God the Son recreates. It is finished and breathes the Holy Spirit into them. For what purpose? He tells us. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you hold bound, they are held bound. He gives them his authority. He says, as the Father sent me so I send you. Well, how did the Father send him? The Father sent the Son to forgive sins and offer sacrifice in his own divine person. And so what does our Lord do? What does he say there? As the Father sent me, so I send you. He'd already told them at the Last Supper, do this in memory of me the sacrifice part, now he's completing it and telling them, you will forgive sins. You have my authority to forgive sins. You will offer sacrifice in my name, but you will offer my sacrifice, the sacrifice of me, because there is no other sacrifice that can be made. And the sacrifice you will offer is you will make my sacrifice come alive Again, you will represent it to the Father for all time, from the rising of the sun to its setting. All nations, everywhere, will make a pure offering to my name. And so our Lord sets the stage. And if we can think of the Mass always as an imitation of what happened here at the Last Supper. It's almost, Bishop Sheen puts it very, almost kind of humorously. He says that God made this first drama, the drama of the Mass, the drama of the Last Supper, of this great sacrifice. And now, what he's done is he has invested people, the church, throughout all these millennia, in all of these different countries, 
different times, different places, with putting on sort of the road show, the traveling show, the representation of it. So if you like, you know, if you like going to different plays, for example, or different theater productions, you oftentimes, you know, theater productions don't rewrite the script. It's the same script, it's the same narrative, it's the same story, just with different actors. Just different actors doing the roles, but it stays the same. It's the same drama. So if you go to, uh, you know, if you go to New York, for example, famous Broadway shows, well, you can go watch a show that was produced or created 25 years ago. As a matter of fact, my favorite show on Broadway is a, a musical called The Phantom of the Opera. I've seen it plenty of times. I, I, I love that show. I can look at the opening night performance of Phantom of the Opera, and then I can go, like I did two weeks ago, to a performance 25 years later and nothing's changed. The actors have changed, but the performance is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter whether I go and watch Phantom of the Opera in New York in 1990 or London in 1995 or Manila in 2000 or Toronto in 1999, it doesn't matter. It's the same performance. The characters walk to the same spot on the stage, they say the same lines, they sing the same songs, everything's identical. Because of the care of the composer who put it together, he wants this performance redone over and over and do you see how let's say that you were the opening night performance the very first time and then 25 years later you're at another performance of it but it's the same it's like you were at the first show because nothing changes that's exactly what the Mass is. It is always the presentation of the Son, the offering of the Son to the Father, but not over and over and over and over again. Not like that, but we are taken back to the original Calvary. That's what the Mass is. We're not making it up. We don't change it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure offering will be made to me by the nations. So our Lord sits in the upper room at the night of the Last Supper. He sits there, and he knows what he is about to do will be redone millions and hundreds of millions of more times throughout all of history. Why? Why does God want us to be at this event. It is the most important event in human history because it is the supreme moment of love. There is no greater moment in all of history than the sacrifice of God for us. No greater love hath man than this, that he would lay down his life for a friend. If that is what is true for us as humans, how much greater a love is it for God 
to lay down his life for a friend. There is no greater moment in all of human history. There can't be. Everything from the past geared for the cross and everything from the cross moving forward points back to it. All of human history devolves to this moment. All of it. Everything. So God wants all of humanity to be able to come to this moment. He wants us physically standing at the foot of the cross at Calvary. And he doesn't care that we're separated from the historical event by centuries and centuries. That means nothing to God. God is outside of time. So he brings that moment to us right here on the altar, wherever we are, whenever we are in human history. Because he wants us to be there standing at the foot of the cross with John, with his mother, with the centurion who will declare truly he is, he was the son of God. He wants us there with the good thief saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Because God transcends time. He isn't bound by time. He injects himself into time. He causes a time warp and pulls all of history to that moment. And this is what mass is. It's so incredible you can't get your mind around it. You can only think about it here and there. A moment here, a moment there, when you begin to realize that when the priest holds up that host and says, this is my body, this is what our Lord was talking about when he said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. It is the most supreme gift of love that our Lord could give us. That he makes available to us to be able to stand at the foot of the cross. Not just a reenactment of it, but a representation of the very moment. We're there. We are at Calvary right there. For those of you who were at Mass here in the last hour, this was Calvary, and the next time Mass is offered on this altar, it will be Calvary again. You know, science talks about all these things up in space. There's wormholes, whatever that is, I still don't quite understand that, but anyway. Uh, there's these wormhole things, and you can do time travel, and if you get stuck in some kind of weird vortex or something, you get sucked back to the beginning of the Big Bang, and blah, 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 blah. Well, half the time, you don't even think that they even know what they're talking about. But they've got all this stuff. Well, if science is allowing in the natural order of things that there's some kind of weird time travel... Although they don't understand it, they can't explain it, they don't even know what it means really. But if they're admitting that that can maybe happen in the natural order, why on earth or in heaven would it not be possible in the supernatural order? Not only is it possible, it happens. It happens. It happens every time you go to Mass. Now let's go back to that prophecy of God to uh, Malachi. From the rising of the sun to its setting. There are approximately, approximately, I think it's 200, I'm sorry, 350 to 400,000 priests in the world. So slightly less than half a million. Just about every one of them, there have been exceptions here and there, maybe because of travel or infirmity or something, but those would be the exceptions. Just about every single one of them will say Mass just about every single day of every week, of every month, of every year. How many times in a day all around the world is a priest standing at an altar and raising the host, raising the chalice, 
this is my body. 300,000 times a day. Well, how many seconds are there in a day? Not that many. So all over the world, imagine God looking down on the world from heaven. And every time the host is lifted up, the Son is offered to the Father. That Calvary is revisited again by somebody somewhere on earth. That a light goes off there. Well, the whole world would be just brilliant flashing lights from the perspective of God the Father. There would be nowhere on the planet, nowhere, that the consecration isn't happening. Hundreds of thousands of times a day, every day, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations. And a pure offering will be made to me, says the Lord. Think about the sun just sort of, you know, moving, or I guess more properly, the earth moving around the sun. Every single, there's nowhere on the planet that... The Father isn't offered, the Son isn't offered to the Father, that we're not drawn back to this moment of Calvary. It is a tremendous, tremendous thing when you think about it. There isn't anything more tremendous, there's nothing more powerful. That the moment of supreme love, hundreds of thousands of times a day, you're brought back to it. There's no way to get your mind around this. And then, that's just on earth. <laughs> that's just on earth. Now, let's think about what's going on in heaven. Because the wedding feast, how many times our blessed Lord used that example as a parable? How many times did he use that? Constantly talked about the wedding feast and the... St. John tells us in the Apocalypse, it's the wedding feast of the Lamb. The church is the bride. Our Lord is the bridegroom. They come together and there's a great wedding feast, a great liturgy. If you go and read the Apocalypse, it's all about Mass. The whole thing is about Mass. There's priests. There's candles, there's incense, there's bells, there's singing, alleluia, there's glorias, there's a feast. The, I mean, the whole thing is Mass. Of course it's Mass. When St. John wrote the Apocalypse near the end of the first century, he was writing it to a besieged group of Catholics. And he was saying, our refuge is in the Mass. Because when we attend Mass here on earth, we are dialed into, we are connected to the feast in heaven. The liturgy that goes on here on earth, as beautiful as they are, many times, as, uh, as involved as they may be, they're never perfect. The sacrifice is perfect, but our participation in it. Sometimes we lose our concentration. Sometimes a car goes by and a horn blows and you forget. And, you know, these sorts of things, all these things that happen here on earth. The actual sacrifice of the Mass is perfect, obviously, but the, our participation in it isn't. Even if my participation today, today might be perfect, the person next to me probably isn't. Or if theirs is perfect today, mine and the person sitting in front of me probably isn't. We get distracted, you know, a cell phone goes off, you, baby cries, whatever. But that's how it is here on earth because we're still in a fallen world. But the liturgy that is going on in heaven is perfect. And one of the beautiful things if you read the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, you see that in that wedding feast, 
the mass in heaven that men and angels are there together worshiping God together joined well you're aware of that in heaven whether you're an angel or a human you know that because you just look beside you and there's an angel but here on earth we don't see them but they're here we may not be perfect in our worship but the angels are and the angels that gather around us when we're at mass they are our conduit they are our connection to heaven when the priest holds up the host and says this is my body the angels here behold the face of God here and in heaven simultaneously if you go into uh, I'm looking around, I don't see it here. This is in an older church. But if you go into an older church, oftentimes you will see uh, angels on the side of where the tabernacle is or the side of the altar, and they're always bowed down. Are they somewhere here and I just don't see them? They are? Where are they? Outside? Oh, okay. <laughs> but not right here. Uh, that's, a sim that's a symbol... The, the architecture or the paintings are a symbol of what's actually going on. That's what all art is. It conveys a reality that is beyond words. That's the point of art. That's why you should never get lost in modern art, by the way. It, what does modern art convey? It conveys confusion and disturbance of the soul. But beautiful art conveys something that words can't. It's like putting words in a bucket or, or putting the, the thought or the feelings in a word bucket. There's too much stuff. It just slops out of the bucket. So we create art because the art bucket is bigger. And you can put things in the art bucket and you can just look at something and no one has to say a single word because a word can't capture the fullness of it. So we see in many churches, we see the... Uh, the artwork of angels on the side, almost always bowed down. Your guardian angel, when we're at Mass, your guardian angel is prostrate. If he had a body, he'd be laying in the aisleway when the priest holds up that host. At this very moment, because our blessed Lord is present right here in the blessed sacrament in the tabernacle, at this very moment, all of heaven is present to this tabernacle. Because God is here, and God is in heaven. And when we start thinking about angels and how these beautiful creatures, these angelic beings, move about amongst us and in the church and in heaven, they aren't trapped in a place like we are. We're trapped in a time and a place because we have bodies, because we have matter. You know, I got an arm and a hand and, you know, whatever, a head. And they're all stitched together. And because it's matter, it has to be in a certain place. Angels don't have matter. They don't have material. They don't have bodies. And since they don't have bodies, they can be in all these different places simultaneously. And they are. And we know this because our blessed Lord says, when he's talking about uh, little children, he says, be sure that you do no harm to any of these children, for I tell you, their angel always beholds their father's face in heaven. So... Here's an angel here on earth with the child that is also present to God in heaven at the same time. This is the advantage of being a spirit. You can be here, there, both places, 15 different places all simultaneously. It's like the wind. It's beautiful that our Lord talked about the wind when Nicodemus came to him in the middle of the night. 
and said, how was any of this possible? How can you be baptized? You, get, you go back to your mother's womb? He didn't understand because our Lord was speaking in the spiritual dimension. And he said, Nicodemus, it's like the wind. You hear the sound of it and you see the effect of it, but you don't know from whether it comes or whether it goes. It's just there and then it's not. Well, this is how it is in the spiritual world. This is why Calvary can be brought from that hill in Golgotha 2,000 years ago and be brought here to us right now. That's how it happens. That historical moment in time, about the year 33, 30, 33, in Jerusalem, right outside the city walls, in that rock quarry, that hill called Golgotha, that event began and ended in time. But the significance of that event extends through all human history, even into heaven. It spans all of creation at the same time. And so when we come to it, we are going, so to speak, back in time. And in the same way that the sacrifice of the Jews in the Old Testament, the lambs and the goats and the oxen, those sacrifices anticipated Golgotha. They looked ahead to Golgotha, to the sacrifice. That's why the sacrifice was acceptable to God. Because he anticipated, they anticipated the sacrifice. And since there was that connection for the time being, those sacrifices were acceptable. But after the sacrifice, that's not needed anymore. That's why St. Paul says, now the law referring to all of these things to, that are associated with this temple sacrifices and all the purification and all of that, they're not needed any longer. So, as Catholics, what do we have? We have the fullest moment that anybody could have at Mass. There is no other thing on earth that a Catholic can do except to assist at Mass to be present to the Mass. It connects us physically, physically connects us to the sacrifice at Golgotha, to the crucifixion. It unites us to all in heaven. When we come up and receive Holy Communion, I mean, think about that for a second, Holy Communion. We have in common, common union, we have in common union that we all are participating in this moment. And not just with the people in this chapel or this parish or this church or that one across the street, but all of them every day all over the world and not just on a flat level of February 2013, but every age and every era and not just every age and era here, but every age and era in eternity in heaven. That's what's going on at Mass. It's why Satan hates the Mass. It's the union of the body of Christ. It's why St. Paul flips out, flips out to the Corinthians when they start abusing the Mass. When you read his letter to the Corinthians, what happens? Well, back in the day, in the very early, early days of the church, the first four, five, six years, because there were no churches and you know, no parishes, uh, the, uh, there was the habit of Catholics would gather together and they'd have a, like a meal meal, normal supper dinner, 
and they'd also have mass in the house. Well, as the communities began to grow, well, you had just like today, you know, everybody in the parish isn't the same. Some people are rich, some people are poor, some people are young, some people are old, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what started happening was that the people who were more wealthy would come to the dinner with all kinds of wine and extra this, and they wouldn't share it with the poor people, and they kind of isolated themselves off to the side, and they got drunk. And St. Paul absolutely lashes out at them. And that's where we hear, in that context, is where we hear him say, if you have not discerned the body and the blood, don't receive. He who eats the body and drinks the blood or eats the bread and brings damnation on himself because he is guilty of the murder of the Lord. Even back then, I mean, the church is maybe five years old at that point. Now we're 2,000 years old. But even all the way back then at almost the very beginning, maybe five years, maybe. This is already going on. There's abuses at Mass going on. And St. Paul immediately, no. Because of what, of how important the Mass is. So, if you go through the great history, our sacred history, 2,000 years, there's never a saint, there's never a doctor or father of the church worth his weight in gold that doesn't understand the significance of the Mass. Nobody gets it totally, not here on earth. You, you can't. It is an infinite act. That's why uh, when you offer Mass for the intention of whatever the intention is, it is an infinite intention. It's why receiving our Lord in a state of mortal sin is so horrible because it is an infinite act. Everything attached to the Mass is infinite because of what the heart of the Mass is. The heart of the Mass is the representation of the infinite Son, the Logos, to the infinite Father. And because of that, everything associated with it is holy. And we need to think of it in those terms. Our angels standing beside us, or kneeling beside us if they had bodies, laying on the floor beside us if they had bodies, however angels do what it is we do, which is kneel and lay prostrate, prostrate, However they do that, they do it at the Mass. And we are caught up with the celebration of the heavenly banquet in heaven. It's the preparation for heaven. Imperfect because of us, but a preparation nonetheless. That's why our Lord has it. Of all the ways he could be worshipped, he picked and commanded this worship. He told the apostles, you will do this in memory of me, the way I want it done, the way my father said it would be done when he told Malachi the prophet. And this way, the Mass belongs to me, not you. The Mass belongs to the Church in the sense of the Church being the body of Christ, the Bride of Christ, His Bride. So, His. The Mass belongs to our Lord, not to any parish, not to any priest, not even to the Pope. 
There's a story told of Pope, I believe it was Pope Pius X, may have been Pius XI, I can't remember now. And somebody came up to him and said, uh, one of his cardinals came up to him and said, you know, uh, you know I'm sorry, this is Pius XI, came up to him and said, uh, you know, maybe we need to change this or do that or something. And he looked at him and said, I can't change that in the Mass, I'm just the Pope. It's a very keen insight. He's just the Pope. He's not God. The Mass belongs to Almighty God. He predicted it in, uh, when he was talking to Jeremiah. He said how it would be done or what its effect would be when he was talking to the prophet Malachi. And he told the apostles how they were to do it at the Last Supper. And then he backed it up on the evening of the resurrection by doing it for them again.